hello. You should see the desktop and hear me. Does everything seem okay? Can you hear me out there? Is it yeah. working? Yes. Hear me? Yeah. Yes, it works. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So we're going to keep uh, practicing. Learn. Learn some more about ML today. Okay. Now. Um, there's a homework assignment. Let me show you different things. There's a homework assignment. We'll look at that in a second. There's another reading assignment, finish chapter five, which is the introduction to ML, and then read chapter six on types, okay? And, and then after chapter six, there's another chapter on ML, okay? But actually this chapter on types is, is a little bit about ML and a little bit about types in general in other programming languages. So today we'll, we'll finish this chapter five, talk about what's in chapter five. And then next week we'll talk about types and we'll start the, uh, the next chapter seven also on a little bit more ML, okay? Um, the homework assignment, oh, let's see, did I forget to, oh, there we go, refresh the page. Okay, so there's a homework assignment too, okay? And download this zip file. You're gonna do a bunch of problems and using ML that are out of the textbook. Okay, now if you extract the zip file, these are the exercises at the end of chapter five. And I put that chapter in here. There's a kind of a, here's that chapter five. So you can, you, you, have, the, you have the homework problems real easily. There, there are the problems. They're at the end of the chapter. So each one asks you to write a simple little function. So you write a function, write a function, write a function, write a function, real simple little ML functions. Okay, so you're going to practice writing kind of simple ML functions. And you'll put your, today we're going to talk about files, but you'll put your answers in this file here. You know, your answer to that problem, your answer to that problem, your answer to that problem. Okay, you'll put your answer in there. And then I'll show you how to run this test file in a minute. The test file will test your answers. and if you run this test file with your code, you should get this output, okay? So you can see what, you'll know when you have the right answer because you'll get, this is the output of, right, of running these tests with this code, okay? Now, right now there is no code to run in here. So I, I, uh, but I'll show you in a minute, we'll, we'll play around with files and see how you run files in, in, in ML, okay? But you put your code in there, you run these tests and you should get this output. Now, when you actually do your work, this is, uh, you'll probably not do your work using this test file. What you should do is, the, the better way for you to do your work, as we'll see, is like to solve this problem here, probably in a separate file, excuse me. This will be a place for you to put your final answers when they're done. Probably what you wanna do is in a separate file, I create a file. Create a, a, a file for just exercise four. You know, put your code in, and then you can put your, you can put your code in here for exercise four. But then you can also go here and You can take the test for exercise four and put them here. And then you can then you can test your exercise four right away. So you can put your code here. And then whoops. And then here will be the Okay, and then when this is working, then you can take your code and put it in that file and accumulate your answers here, 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 and then then your answers will be ready to turn in because I'll I'll test I'll test your I'm going to test this file of yours that has all your solutions in it. But when you want to work on each problem, you're probably better off creating a file for a problem. Your code will go there. 
take the tests out of the test file, put them in there. Then you can just run, I'll show you in a minute, but then you can just run this and it'll tell you right away if this guy produces the right output. And you can even go here to the, the output one. And while well, here, they're not divided between which outputs are which, okay? So you don't see, you know, you, you'll have to figure out which outputs are for exercise four and which ones are exercise five. But you know, this, this will be probably the way, the, the, the best way for you to work on your code. You don't want to try to write all of these at once and then run them through the test because you'll get way too many errors. You know, no, programmers should never try to do the whole thing at once. You, know, you, you just solve one little piece at a time and then put things together. So you know, probably you'll want a file for each homework assignment, a file for each exercise with, uh, with your code, with your code for the exercise, the tests that were for that exercise. Then when you have the exercise done, copy that code into the, the file you're gonna turn in. Then go to the another one, create a file for this one, copy the tests for exercise five. There's a few tests for exercise five, copy that into the file with your solution to exercise five, get five working and passing the tests, then copy the code into here. Okay, all right, all right. So that's the homework assignment. Okay. Okay, it's due a week from Tuesday. Let's see, did I get that right? Yeah, week from Tuesday. It's due a week from Tuesday. Okay, all right. Um, some of these are really simple to get you started, and some of them actually are, you have to think a little bit about it. But most of these are pretty simple to get you just used to using ML. Okay, now, um, I think that's... Okay. Any question about the homework? I, I, we have to talk about how to use files. But does anybody have a question about the homework assignment first? Anybody got a question about what we just talked about? Anything? Okay. Well, let's. The other day in class, we did everything in ML using the REPL. Okay. So here's my shortcut to the REPL. And you know, I can open the REPL, but the trouble with this is you, know, you, you type some code. And you know, there's nothing to save your code. You, you get out of the REPL by telling it there's, well, you can just close, you can do that to get out of it, but that's actually not the best way to get out of it. Well, the, the best way to get out of it, the really right way is to type control Z here. That says that the REPL, there's no more input. Remember, we, we, control Z is the way you tell a program that there's no more input. Now, on your hand, if you if you happen to be running on a Linux machine, you don't use control Z, you use control D. But control D doesn't work on Windows. Okay, So on Windows, you use control Z. And on Linux, you would use control D to say that there's no more input. Okay, um, in, in this program, Sometimes people will quit a program by using control C, but control C doesn't work in here. Control C interrupts the running program, doesn't interrupt the REPL. So see, if I type, that, that's what you would do if you were in an infinite loop. If you were running a program in here and it was either spitting out too much output or it was in an infinite loop, control C would interrupt the, the, the infinite loop, but it doesn't kill the uh, REPL. So you get out of the REPL by control Z, then you have to hit enter. And that's the nice, I'll show you in a minute why that's the better way. That's better than just doing that, okay? I'll show you why in a second. All right, now you don't wanna use the REPL because for the most part, once you when you leave the REPL, you lose your work. You know, the, uh, you can do weird things like you can type some code here Then you could save your work by doing edit, select all, edit, copy, and then you could save your work in a text file. Okay, 
that's a really but notice that you're you're not saving code you're saving the whole uh transcript of what you did in the REPL. Now, this can be a useful trick if you've got a weird error message in the REPL and you want to say, how do, what's this error message mean? You could take a screenshot of the REPL or you could save the state of the REPL like this, either one. But if you've got a weird error message, either taking a screenshot of the REPL or saving its output can be useful. Saving output like this can be useful because you, you can actually copy and paste this back into the REPL. Screenshots, uh, uh, screenshots aren't a good way to communicate with programmers. Uh, a lot of you are sending me screenshots of code when you have questions. That's not a good idea. Screenshots are not a good way to communicate with other programmers because you can't do anything with a screenshot, but look at it. For example, if you save your work like this, I could say, hmm, let me try that line of code in the REPL. I can copy and paste it into the REPL myself and see what happens. Okay, sending text is way better than sending pictures. But sometimes a picture, like sometimes a picture is real good because error messages tend to be hard to reproduce. Yeah, like in this case, if there's an error message in the REPL, okay, the, a, a, a screenshot will take it, but you can, you know, you can also just, select all and you get the whole error message okay and then you could paste it in there okay right uh when you when you get weird error messages if you don't understand them you know you need you need to capture the error message yeah you could you could send the code that creates the error message but sometimes you want to you, you want maybe a little bit more than that like, yeah, you know, that was the code that created the error message. So you could send somebody that code and say, what's wrong with it? And they could try it themselves and get the error message. Or you could capture the whole session. The, the, it's better to either send the code that causes the error or send uh, the text like this. Screenshot, every once in a while, the only good way to capture the error messages is in a screenshot. Okay, sometimes that's not really the only good way to capture the error message. but you're better off sending code or te text. You're better off sending text to people rather than sending pictures. Programmers prefer getting text that they can copy and paste, edit, make changes to. You know, when you send a screenshot, there's really nothing. If, if I see something in the screenshot, I have to type it in myself and then I could introduce an error. You know, then that's more, that, then, then I could misread something. Yeah, so, so uh, th but this trick of doing this can be useful. Select all, you know, edit, copy. But notice Windows is real clunky. When you're using a console window and you want to copy things, you have to do it as a two-step process. Um, see, that doesn't work. If you, if you highlight it, I don't, it used to, let's see. I, um, let me try something. Windows has Windows has been trying to make their console windows work better for years. They've been trying to make them easier to work with. What happens if I just like highlight, say three lines? Okay, so I highlighted them, but Control C. Let's see if Control C did work. I did. I highlighted them and I typed Control C. Ah, it did work. It, it did fine. It didn't used to work. Oh, that's actually not bad. So like I can highlight that line now. If I type control C, notice that the highlighting goes away, which is kind of weird, but it did seem to copy what I asked for. Okay, that it didn't use, I think Windows 10 is the first time that that's worked in. Okay, so you can, you can actually then like just copy that, you know, you could copy the piece that you're interested in. But okay, again, I, I, uh, if I type control C, that captured it. I wonder if it can do it. Let's we'll see. If I right click on, see, I can't right click on it and do copy. See, every time I try to right click on it, it disappears. So if I highlight it and I right click on it, usually you, you know, on an editor, you highlight something and you right click on it and you can say copy. That doesn't work in the console window. So right. Yeah, you know, highlight it, right click on it, 
and and the console window just loses the highlighting. But control C does work now. So highlight it, then the control key, control C, the highlighting goes away, but it did remember what I highlight, it did capture what I wanted. Okay. It's better to copy text and send text to someone than a, you know, prefer text unless you really have a good reason to take a screenshot. You know, if, if you can you know, prefer text, a screenshot, if that's the only really good way to capture the problem you're having. Okay. All right. Now, let's look at some other things about playing with the, count, with the, the REPL. Okay. So you don't want to write code in the REPL because it, it doesn't really save your work. Yeah, and even yeah, you, know, you can like you know, now we see you can save your work, but that's what you really want to do is work in a file, and somehow open the file in the REPL. Okay, so that's what we're going to look at now. How would you open a file in the REPL and work with the with the co code in a file? Okay, so I've got an example file here. The extension doesn't really mean anything. Traditionally, people I'll show you it doesn't really mean much, but Here's some code in a file. Doesn't do anything really interesting. Uh, set x equal to zero, set y equal to one, set z equal to a list, set w equal to a tuple, uh, set x2 to the result of this if expression, call uh, some examples of calling a function. Okay, so how can I run that code? Okay. The easiest, now notice I've got a shortcut to the, to the REPL on my desktop. I copied that shortcut out of the start menu. Like after you install uh, ML, it'll appear in your start menu. And I just made a copy of what was in the start menu there. So I can double click on that and, and start up the, the REPL. Okay. You can also just take this code and drag and drop it there. See, it just ran. Okay. When I dragged and dropped the code in the REPL, it ran. Okay. That's good, but that's still not the right way to do things. Okay. That's not a good, that what there's, here, let me show you what's wrong with that. I'm going to put an error in my code. I'm missing that semicolon. Drag and drop, nothing. Drag and drop, nothing. Okay. What happened was when I dragged and dropped, the error message popped up. The compiler, I'm sorry, when I dragged and dropped, the REPL ran. The compiler said that there's a compiler error. It printed out the compiler error and closed. So it flashed, essentially, it flashed for a brief second. So the error messages appeared in the console window, but then the console window closed because the program was over. Okay. Okay. So notice that drag and drop doesn't work very well because if it only works if your code is correct. See, if your code is correct, it compiles your code and then it doesn't close because it's waiting for more input. So, but since but if there was an error in there, it would close itself because of the error. Okay, so now it's waiting for me to, like, I can close it. So what's a better way to use a file? A better way to use a file is to open a command prompt, okay? So I'm going to open a command window here at my desktop, okay? Then I can type the, the name of my shortcut, okay? That's my shortcut. Now, actually, what I just did was I typed the first few letters of it, SML, and hit the tab key. So I don't have to type out that whole thing. I type, and then my file, I, then I type the name of my file. My file is example one. Well, I just type EX and hit the tab key, okay? Then it ran the REPL with that as input, okay? Now, now this is the better, now here's why you don't wanna exit the REPL this way. Because if you have to exit the REPL this way, you lost your command prompt. So what's the better thing to do is open the command window, Start up the REPL with your input file. If you want to exit the REPL to do something, control Z, then up arrow on the keyboard opens the REPL again. Now, what you can do is if there's a mistake, you can exit, fix your file, then load it again, see the results, close the REPL, fix your file, load it again. So, for example, I'll put a compiler error back in there. So now I can have my file open, you know, you know, normally what I would do is I would have these two side by side. I'd have my file here, the REPL here. And and uh, those of you who use big fancy IDEs, you'd be surprised how many professional programmers actually work this way. 
you know, you'd be surprised. This is actually not a bad way to write code. You know, here's my code, here's where I execute it, and I can just go back and forth. And, and this is actually uh, not unproductive. You know, the, uh, Java, languages like Java, C, and C++ work better in an IDE, but functional languages like ML, Haskell, uh, Ruby, there's a lot of the mo more functional modern languages, they actually work pretty well this way. You, you, you get used to working in this kind of just editor REPL. You know, this is where I make changes. This is where I see the results, okay? Now, if I put an, a problem in there, now when I run it again, I get, here's, see, notice that it did not stay in the REPL. After the REPL gave me the compiler error message, I'm back at the command prompt. That's why I want to do this in the command prompt, because that's why if I just run this file by drag and drop, I don't get anything, because the REPL is starting up, printing out the error message, and quitting. And when the REPL quits this way, there's nothing there. Okay, so you 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 should prefer running it in a you, know, you start a command window. Okay, in and usually you would do this in a folder. Like I'm doing this on my desktop. You really should work in a folder. So you would open a command prompt in that folder. You could put a shortcut to the REPL in the folder. Okay, actually. I, Here's how I would, like if you're working on the homework, well, here's the homework folder. Put a copy of the shortcut in there. Put my code in there. Okay. And then I open a command prompt in this window. You know, that would be my usual, my usual way of working would be to have my, my code in a folder open a command prompt at that folder, open my code in an editor, okay? Then run the code. Now I need to start, since I just opened that command prompt, I need to start the REPL with my example code. Okay, oh, I got an error message, a compiler error. You know, everybody's compiler gives lousy error messages. This is ubiquitous. All compilers give lousy error messages. People have been spending years and years and years trying to write compilers with better error messages. They're actually starting to make progress on that. Um, the Rust language, I'm, I, I was playing around with it last year. The compiler gives amazingly good error messages. You can actually read them. They, they, it actually tells you what's wrong. SML is more or less like C and C++. About the only thing it tells you useful is what line your error is on. So, you know, like here, what is, I'm on line 14. My error is on line 14, okay? Over here, my line is 14. I'm missing the semicolon at the end. You know, the main thing you wanna look for is what line. Sometimes you, can t sometimes you can figure out from the error message what the problem really is. More often than not, you can't. Uh, uh, Java's better than C and C++. C++ is infamous for giving you really bad compiler error messages. I wrote a one-line uh, C++ program that generated two pages of error messages. It, 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 it's, it's actually possible. It's, 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 a, it's a little game you can play. You write one line of C++ and then see how long of an error message you can get from the compiler. And I think once I managed to find an error, there was almost two pages of error. There's just one line of code generated like a hundred errors. Okay, C++ is really bad. Java's better. SML is not that great, okay? The main thing is what line number. Sometimes you can make sense of the error message. More often than not, yeah, you, you can't. But you, you, uh, if you if you can go to the line number and figure out exactly what the problem is, good. If you can't, then you may have to try with the error message. And then that's where you're asking for help. That's where we're asking for help. You know, sometimes you'll get compiler errors, which are just hard to figure out. Okay. There'll be times, especially with a language like ML, there'll be times when the error messages are very hard to decipher. Okay. So I fix the problem, save the file, go back over here, run it again. Okay. All right. So that's a that's how you'll do your homework assignment. Now, in your homework assignment, oh, there and there's another way to do this. 
let me show you another. Okay, right now we've got two ways to run that that file there. You can just drag and drop it on the REPL, but get um. Uh, that, that was the wrong one. You can drag and drop it on the REPL, okay? But the trouble with that is if there's an error, a compiler error, you lose the error message. So, so that's only useful when the program's done. When the program's done and working, you can just run it that way, but that's not gonna help you if you're trying to figure out what's wrong. So that's one way. The other way is to open a command prompt and type the name of the REPL with the name of the file, okay? And that'll run that file. Now, there's another thing you can do. You can just run the REPL, and this is actually a fairly common way to do things. Now you can tell the REPL to load files, okay? So you say use, quote, then the name of the file. semicolon. See, it loaded the file. Now, what's kind of nice about this is if I go and make changes in the file, like I'm going to make x equal to 1000, control S, then you can go here and up arrow and reuse the file. Okay, so you can reload the file. Okay, so you can just reload the file. If you keep, if you're getting error messages, for example, and you're trying to fix the error messages, each time you like um, goof things up here in a couple ways. Okay, now I've got several errors. So use it again. Okay, I've got an error on line nine. Operate, no, I got an error on line nine. Okay, well, the error was really the missing semicolon. Okay. Okay. Okay, so fix it, reload it. Oh, let's see. Oh, no, that, that wasn't the, um, see, that wasn't the error. The error isn't even on line nine. I think, let's see. Yeah, the error was on line, oh, I miss, yeah, I was reading things wrong. I was going to line eight, yeah, there was missing the semicolon on line nine, okay? It was missing the semicolon on line nine. Now I have a problem on line 12, okay? I have a problem on line 12, okay? Operator is not a function. Not sure what they mean by that, okay? But what it is is missing the semicolon, okay? You know, the, the, you notice that the the error message got there. Really, nothing wrong with that operator. There's really a problem with the semicolon. Well, I'm sorry. What's happening is actually here's what what ML is doing. Without that semicolon, it's sort of putting these together like that, and then it doesn't make sense to it. It's treating that all as one line. So the error message is coming from the fact that this thing has been concatenated together and it's not making sense of it. So the error message is really kind of weird. And the problem is it's missing that semicolon, okay? So fix it, then recompile. Now I've got a problem on line 13, okay, line 13. Oh, operator and operand do not agree. That makes a little bit more sense. The operator, okay, the operator on line 13 is addition. Okay. Operator and operand. Let's see. With it, operator and operand. See. Okay. Operator and operand do not agree. Operand. The operator takes in an int. The operand is a real, and the expression is real of 1.0. Okay, now this is one of ML's better error messages once you figure, get used to reading it. Okay, it's telling you that, it's essentially saying that where you have an int, you should have had a real. I'm sorry, where you should have had an int, you had a real. The operators 
type, do domain means the input. So the operator wanted input that was an integer, but the actual operand was a real. Then it says the expression that it was working on was real of 1.0. Well, the real function converts integers to real. So this one's supposed to have been an integer that gets converted to a real number. So the real function takes in an integer and converts it to a real number. See, unlike uh, C and C++ and Java, see, you can do that in Java. Java will automatically promote 1 to 1.0 for you. ML won't. ML says you have to tell me to convert it to a real number. OK, so you have to officially convert the int to a real. Now, I actually had a real there and it won't convert a real to a real. So the error message was operator and operand do not agree. The operator domain, that's what it wanted. The domain was supposed to have been int, but the actual operand was a real. Then here's the thing. It shows you what expression it was working on. So it was working on that piece of that line. So on line 13, it was having trouble with real of 1.0. Okay, so it's supposed to be real of one. Okay, save that, then go over here and recompile, and now it's okay. All right, some error messages are better than others. When when you have a, a, a wrong type, you usually get a more readable error message. When you have like this one where I tried to, or uh, here's another example, just a real simple one, two plus 3.0, okay? That doesn't work because I can't mix these. I can do two plus three is legitimate and 2.0 plus 3.0 is legitimate, okay? Okay, those are legitimate. Two ints is legitimate and two doubles is legitimate. They won't let you mix up the types. It's got to be either two ints or two two reals. You can't mix them up. Okay. Now, if you go over here and run it. Oh, I didn't save it. See, I forgot. Now you gotta be careful. I forgot to save it. Go over here and run it. Okay. And then you get this operator and operand do not agree. So you've got something mixed up with the type. Okay. Now this one's a little bit harder to read because it's a, a it's a this guy takes in two operands. The plus takes in an operand on the left and an operand on the right. Okay, well, actually, we're down here at this one. Okay, and it says the operator domain was integer. Now, remember, we said that we talked about tuples the other day. This star here is more, it's not multiplication. I'm doing the addition operator. This is a tuple notation. It's saying that the operator was taking in two ints. See, this was their way of, this is like using the tuple notation. So the, the operator domain was two ints, but what you gave it was an int and a real. See, I gave it an int and a real. And it and then it says, okay, that's what I was complaining about. Okay. So now remember two reals is correct and two ints is correct. When you mix it up, what the compiler did was it defaulted to the two int cases. See, it could have it could have said I was looking for two reals, but I got an int and a real. But what it does is when you mix it up, it its default case for addition is two ints. So when you don't give it the right thing, it says I was expecting two ints, a pair of ints, a tuple. I was expecting two ints, but you gave me an int and a real in that expression there. Okay. So that's that's more readable. Yeah. Op whenever you see operator and operand do not agree, you've got the you've got one of the inputs to some operator wrong. Okay. All right. All right. Now, so this is the preferred way to actually this is actually the, the way that people really do work with ML. They tend to use this use, okay, they read in a file. So for example, for the homework assignment, like for exercise four, what I would probably, a better way, if you, want, if you do this the real professional way, okay, you would take these tests and move them from here into another file.
and then this would be a file called, say, uh, exercise for tests.sml. Did I type that wrong? Right? Okay. Then I have my code here. Okay. I'll just type something that. Okay. Meaningless little piece of code. Okay. And then over here, I would use exer quote. Well, Load my code. Oh, I forgot this the semicolon. Load my code, then load my test. And I could have various test files. Okay. Now my test didn't fit, they, they failed. There was a problem with the test. Okay. But you could you could then uh, load your and then you could you could load your code. Uh, Keep forgetting. Yeah, you would load your code, load your tests, and see the results. Okay. Then go back and maybe do something to the code. And then if you had other test file, you could have tests two. You could go through a sequence of test files. Okay. So you'd have your code and your code would be in one file, your test would be in another file. And then over here, you can alternate between loading the code, loading the test. No, um, when you load your code, the, the interpreter remembers what it's loaded. So if you define something in the this file, then when you load this file, this file can use what was defined in this file. Okay, right. So like here, I'm supposed to be defining a function called min three. So over here, I would have a function function min min three of say, so let's take in three numbers, x, uh, an x, a y, and a z, and I'm just gonna return x, okay? All right, so load my code, exercise for SML, okay? I've got my function, min three, min, three of uh, seven, six, five. Misspelled it. There. Okay, I'm just returning the first parameter. So I'm not actually computing a minimum. I'm just returning the first parameter. Okay, then I can run my test. And I would see that those are not the right results. Okay, okay, those are not the right answers. The, the right answers are in the file here. Okay. So I know right now we don't have an automated way to tell you, you if you do you find out if you pass your test just by comparing those outputs to these outputs. Okay. And they don't match. Okay. So these outputs don't match those outputs. Later on, we'll see more sophisticated ways to do tests. So this is kind of bare bones. So you can run your code, run your tests. There's the output, and here's what the output should be. Okay. And if you want, you could you could you could have the tests in the file with the code, but it's probably the better way would be to have your code in one file, your tests in another file, your code in one file, your tests in another file. Then you could get the code working, compare, run against the test. You could have multiple sets of tests. When the code is working, remember I said for the homework assignment, you'll put it in. Yeah, you know, when you got working code, you'll put it in there and accumulate all your. Uh, accumulate all your working code. When, when I go to grade it, I'll just run all your code against all the tests and see that you get that output. So I'll be testing all your code at once with all the tests to see that you get the right output. But when you're doing the work, you don't, that's, you know, you don't want to have 
10 problems, try, you don't want to be working on 10 problems at once. And if you've got uh, four, five, six, and seven working, and you're working on eight, you don't want to run the test for all those while you're trying to do eight. So, you know, this is not a good way to work. It's a better way to work is one file per problem. So create your own little exercise four file, exercise five file, exercise six file, have an exercise four, five, and six test. When each one is finished and working, paste the work into here and, and accumulate. And then when you're done, make sure that this thing runs and gives you the full correct output. Okay. All right. So the best way to work with files is to just start the REPL in the folder that your homework is in, your work is in. So you, you, you want to start the REPL in that folder, okay? Because that way, the, rep, the when you start the REPL in that folder, that's where use knows, well, it'll find the files in that folder. If I, okay, let me do something here. If I start the REPL here, okay, now that REPL started on the desktop, okay? If I say use, Uh, exercise four dot SML. Can't find it because this guy is in the desktop. So he sees what's on the desktop and the file I want is in this folder. So it, it doesn't see it. On the other hand, I could be a little bit more precise and say, use the file homework to in that folder. See, that worked. Okay. All right. So that worked because I said what folder to look in. Okay. Now notice here's Windows. See how folders are divided by that slash there going this way? Notice over here I used the other slash. I used the other slash when I did that using. See, I'm not sure if I, I probably hear, this is the Linux slash for folder separators. This is the Windows slash for folder separators. Some programs like this were written for Linux and they understand either, they'll either understand only the Linux folder separator or they'll understand both. We'll see in a second where this one understands both. So. Let's see if this one even, does this one work with the other folder separator? They didn't like it. Now, it might work if I do slash slash. Yeah, see, but see, because that slash is the escape character. So then I have to say slash slash to escape the slash. Okay, so I could say homework to slash slash now i'm using the windows slash character but since that's the escape character i have to escape the slash okay on the other hand i can just use the uh linux slash folder because this program was originally written for linux and it understands that now windows programs don't understand that slash if a program was originally written for windows it won't know what to do with that slash now that slash is also the slash we use on the internet Notice that when you separate URLs, see, that's because guess who wrote the code for the internet? It was Unix people. The code for the internet was written by Unix people, not Windows people. So they use the Unix slash for separating files. Okay. ML, well, luckily ML understands both of them. Okay. So if you, if you open a REPL anywhere, you can open a file anywhere, but you may have to tell the use command how to find the file. You may have to tell use how to find the file. Okay, that can be a nuisance. The easiest way to do things is to just use the w Windows ability to open a full uh, command prompt in that folder. Now, what's the easiest way to open a command prompt in that folder? Probably the easiest way is to click up there and type CMD. See, there's, there's a command prompt in that folder. That's a weird trick. You, you, you click in this bar and you type CMD. And now you got a CMD in that folder. If you go over here and type CMD, you get a CMD in your home directory. 
see, see, I'm, I'm, I'm logged in as a user called classroom. That's my, let's see, that's the C drive users. That's my home directory is that user. Okay. So if you, you know, that's, that's not the greatest way to create a CMD because it always starts in your home directory. The nicest, if you, if you have your work in a folder, the way to start the CMD, now on my machine, I have a setup so I can right click here and say, now your machine probably not set up that way. Because by default, Windows doesn't do this thing here. By default, this would be open PowerShell window here, but I don't want to use a PowerShell window. Okay, so I have my computer set up to open a command prompt there, but it's just as easy to do this thing of click in the address bar and type CMD in the address bar and hit enter, and you've got a command prompt in that window. Then put a shortcut to the uh, put a shortcut to the REPL in that folder, start the REPL, then use then use a use command to open the file. That's the preferred way to work. Okay? That's the preferred way to work. Okay? And then the file can be open in an editor so you can go back and forth between compiling and running and editing you know go back and forth between editing compile run edit, compile run okay now let's see what else i thought of something oh i thought of something a second ago i wanted to show you now i forgot what it was Oh, I, yeah, I remember now. The extension, I don't think matters. So take this guy and make it a text file. Okay. Then go over here. I don't think it matters. So now let me, see, didn't care. Okay. I can even do something really dumb. Now the Java compiler does care about the extension. The Java compiler will not compile a Java file if you call it myfile.c. Yeah. But ML really doesn't care about extensions. See? Now use the SML extension. Yeah, but it's kind of interesting to it's 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 interesting to see that the ML and the C language is like that too. The, the C compiler doesn't care what the extension to a C file is. The, the uh, ML compiler doesn't care what the extension to a, a, an ML file is. And S actually stands for standard ML. So it's actually a ver There are several different versions of the ML language out there. And the, the most common one is SML, standard ML but it's kind of a quirky thing. You'd think that standard ML would be ML, but it turns out the standard ML is a slightly, it's actually a slightly different dialect of ML, but it's the dialect that everybody uses. So, I mean, you could, you could call these ML files too, but it's kind of the, the most people will call them SML files, okay? Java is a kind of funny language. Java is one of the few languages where the compiler actually cares what the extension to the file is. It wants the extension to be .java. It will not compile a file if you give it some other extension. The compiler will just say it's not a, a legitimate Java file. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see, what time is it? What do we got, 20 minutes left? I lost track of time. We have, is it 20 minutes that are left? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, now let's go, let's, so all that was mostly talking about using the system. And, and probably the most important part was showing you some error messages and getting, you know, that'll be one of the hardest things is working your way through error messages until you get a little bit used to them. Uh, but that's the case of almost all compiled languages. 
you know, most compilers do not give good error messages. Okay, now, the next thing to talk about is ML's use of functions. Okay, so if we look at this first look of ML, the, this is the outline of the chapter. You know, we've looked at operators, defining variables, tuples. This is the, the let's talk about defining a function. Okay, your homework assignment is of defining functions. Okay, so uh, the, the syntax for defining a function, I showed it to you just a second ago. I'll, I'll just do, okay. You type the word, fun. now variables, you type V-A-L, val x equal 34, okay? For functions, you type F-U-N, the name of the function, then it's input parameters, equal what you want to do with the function. So that's a squaring function. Okay. Okay. Now notice I didn't type anything about what the type of the input was. I just said function f takes in an x and it gives me back x times x. ML gave it a type. Just like over here, ML gave my x a type. The type is int. See, there's the type of x. It's the number 34 is an int. The type of f, f is a function, f is a function from integer to integer. It's now here's the key word for declaring a function. Here's the thing that says that the type is a function. So the letters fn is the type. F U N declares a function. It's called f. f has a type. f has the type function from integer input to integer output. Now, where did it get the integer input, integer output? Because the multiplication symbol defaults to integer times integer. So since the multiplication symbol defaults to integer times integer. When I use it in the function body, it says, well, that should be an int and that should be an int. So F takes int, int and gives me back ints. Now, on the, now, the multiplication symbol, like the addition symbol can take in doubles, well, reals. Okay. But if ML doesn't see anything otherwise, it defaults to being int times int, okay? So my function takes in two integers. So f of six is 36. f of nine is going to give me 81. Now, notice how I call the function, the name of the function, space, the input to the function, then a semicolon to end the line, OK? So zero squared is zero, OK? One squared. Now, if I want, I could put, now, people don't usually do this. I can use Java-like notation, but but don't because that's misleading. You know, it looks like the right thing, but it's actually not quite right. Okay. In fact, I can do this. That's actually more correct. That's more correct than this one was. Okay. What's actually correct in this case is the function only takes in one number. So I'd say f of seven, okay, there's my function, all right? Now, what if I wanted to, to take in a double? What if I wanted f to take in 7.0? See, I'm gonna get an error message. My function was supposed to take in, see, operator and operand do not agree. The operator expected integers and you gave it a real in the expression f of 7.0, okay? How can I get a function that takes in two? What, what, how can I get a function that squares reals? So I'll say function g of x equal. Okay, um, what I have to do is I have to I put a colon real here. I actually say to, to ML, but I want the input to be a real number. Okay, 
I'm it's kind of like now I'm I'm being a little bit more like Java. I'm saying, but X is a real. And then the output would be X times X. Okay, so now ML said, okay, you want it to be a real. So now the function takes in reals and gives you out reals. This is one, most of the time in ML, you don't have to say what your types are, but every once in a while, you have to force the issue. You have to declare what the type is. Normally in, F, in ML, ML picks the right types, but the, the one place where you tend to do this is it with the difference between doubles and re, between integers and reals. The plus operator defaults to int and the multiplication operator defaults to int. So if you wanna do, if you wanna do functions with real numbers, you kind of have to say, I want real numbers, okay? You kind of have to say it because if you define a function, h, and you it takes in an x, and you have to do some complicated calculations. So you might say uh, x squared. Well, actually, let me, let, me try, let me change something. Here's another way to make it a real. Suppose I do 1.0 times x times x. Okay, now that's the squaring function. What this guy does is force the issue that everything should be a real. Now I didn't, I didn't say that x is real, but now what ML said was, wait a minute, you're taking a real times this x. That multiplication needs two reals. That one's a real, so that must be a real. If that one's a real, that's what your input is. And then the result is real. That's the type inference. But this is kind of hokey. Forcing the issue this way is kind of hokey. It's better to just declare it like I did earlier when I said that, where was it? I forget what line it was now. Oh, this is why you don't want to write code in a REPL because it could be hard to go back and forth and find your code. Okay, where was it? Oh, right here. Yeah, here's where I force the issue by declaring X to be a real. I force the issue here by just throwing in an arbitrary real number, 1.0, okay? That's kind of a bad way to do it. But the, but the only time you need to force a type in ML is when you're doing arithmetic and you want the arithmetic to be with real numbers because most arithmetic, the arithmetic operators default to being integers. So to, to force them to work with reals, you either have to say, the variable is a real, or you have to throw some real constant in there. Okay. Like now, if you really, if I was doing the function 2x, if I was really doing the function 2x squared, then that's fine. There's 2x squared. You know, then the two is serving a purpose. But if I write this, now it's back to int. Now it's the function 2x squared, but everything is an int. But if I force the issue with a 2.0, then it's real, okay? And I can do, now, what if I do this? Okay, I say I'm forcing the issue, x is real, and the result is two times x times x. Anybody wanna guess what this is gonna do? It's time to start thinking like an MLer. What's this gonna do? Give an error. Why? Because two is an integer and X is the real. Yeah, it, you force the issue that X is real, but multiplication has to have two reals or two ints. It can't mix. This one's an int, so, but you force this one to be a real. So that means that's int times real. So ML is going to give you a type error in the function definition, okay? So in that definition, I got a type error. And you, know, you, you look carefully, uh, right-hand clause does not agree with function result type, okay? The right-hand side is producing an int. Well, actually, no. Well, I mean, on the right-hand side, claw, oh, clause. Well, yeah, this clause here doesn't work, okay? Expression is, so you gave it an int where it expected a real. And it's this guy that it doesn't like. This guy is the, this guy is the int that was supposed to be a real. 
So in this part here, there was something wrong. Int times real doesn't work. Okay. So if I'm going to, now, if I go back here and I put a 2.0 here, it works. It's a little bit redundant now. I don't need to force X to be a real because there's a real in here. So most MLers would then now drop the real from there. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, this is one of the weirder things about ML. The, the, the fact that ML takes either two ints or two doubles for addition cause, trips a lot of people up because you're so used to almost every other language being happy to take two plus 3.0 and convert that to a double. But like I mentioned the other day, more and more languages are stopping doing this and they're becoming more strict about this. So Rust won't do this. Rust will not allow you to do that. Haskell will not allow you to do that. ML, ML is not a new language. ML is a really old language, but it was the first language to say, that's not a good idea. And finally, 30, 40 years later, other people are finally agreeing with the ML people saying, you're right, that's really not a good idea. We need to be more careful about our programs. It's not, it's, it's weird to think that this is a bad thing to do, but it turns out that ML is probably right. You shouldn't be mixing up these types. You're, you're letting the language make a choice for you that maybe you're being a little bit sloppy about. The real problem is more when you have variables and you're not sure what they are. Well, what's an X? What's a Y? You know, ML saying, you better know for sure, are you adding two ints, are you adding two doubles, or are you adding an int to a double? Because of rounding errors and all kinds of weird things like that. So ML says, well, if, if Y is a real and you want to add it to X and X is an int, you have to do that. You have to convert X to real to add it to Y. You have to be aware of what your types are. And this could cause a weird rounding error. You know, the, the, it's amazing when you read the history of programming, how subtle the bugs are that have crept into programs. Simple little things like this can cause weird things where you just did not pay attention to the types and didn't realize that adding an int to a double may not be exactly what you think it's doing, okay? So ML says, be very explicit about everything, but it does make things kind of messy, you know, at least until you get used to it, okay? So the syntax for function, back to, is fun, name of the function, input, now I'm gonna do a function with two variables, input parameters equal, then what the result is. I'm going to say X. Now, what is that symbol for? Does anybody remember? Does anybody remember what that was the symbol for? It's a weird one. That's the symbol for concatenating two strings. Okay. So my function now is a function of string two string, two strings, and the output is a string. So I have a function that takes in two strings. So f of cat and dog, okay, gives me cat dog, all right? Okay. Notice that I type f of one parameter and just the other parameter, okay? No parentheses, okay? Now, later on, we'll learn that you can put parentheses in this thing, but like, for example, here's why you shouldn't use Java notation. That's wrong. Try putting a comma in there, that's still wrong. That's not the notation for a function of two parameters. See, that's not wrong but I can do the following. I can put parentheses like that. You gotta be, ML's got very different rules than what you're used to from languages like C and C plus and JavaScript. My F takes two parameters and I call it by saying, here's the first parameter, 
here's the second parameter. Okay, that's the preferred way to do it. Okay, there's the two parameters. Okay, if it's a function of one parameter, you just type the parameter. Oh, let's we'll see. I forgot what H was. Uh, oh, H probably took in a int. Yeah, H took in a double. Okay. Oh, if I ask what H is, it'll remind me H was a function from real to real. F, what is F? F is a function. See, so notice how you can ask it what things are. Okay. I can ask it what is F? They'll tell me F is a function that takes in a string and a string and gives me back a string. Okay. Well, you notice that the notation is a little bit weird. You read this as first parameter second parameter output so the function takes in one two parameters and gives me out that result takes in two strings and gives me out uh okay. and i can i can define other kinds of functions uh i'll say function g that takes in an x and a y and gives me out um let's see i think it's c um what converts a number to a string. He's got a little table in here. Okay, real converts int to real. Floor converts real to int by chopping off the decimal place. Ceiling converts real to int by rounding up. Round converts real to int the right way, the usual rounding way. Trunk converts real to int by chopping things off. Where's the one? See, or takes a character and tells you what integer it is. Care takes an integer and tells you what character it is. And um, oh, there, oh, he doesn't tell you. There's one that'll convert uh, an integer to string. It, it's not in here. I don't. I don't remember which what the the, the function is. Uh, I don't remember which what function converts an integer to a to its like 123. What what's the, you know converted to the string one two three? It's not one of these. Um, I don't. Let's try str. I don't. Let's see. Str 67. Doesn't like it, yeah. So str, this one takes in a character. No, it converted the character to the string, but it only converts one character to a string. Okay. Oh, I don't remember. I thought that I I thought he had it in here. I do not remember what converts an integer to a string. I was going to come. I was going to write a function that took in a string and an integer. Okay. Um, let me write a function. G. Takes in an x and a y, and um, I'll make it. Um, okay, what's that do? Function takes x and a y, x plus ord y. Ord y from over here is the ordinal of the character, so it tells you what integer it is. So ORD stands for the ordinal number of the character. So that converts the character to what its, in, its numeric value is in the ASCII table. So this guy gives me back an integer. 
So then that must make this one an integer. So my function is a function that takes in an integer and a care and gives me back an int. See, so it's a function that takes in an int and a care and gives me back an int. Okay, then if I try it out, g of 10, and then the care, remember the character literal is real ugly here. Like you do pound sign, quote, seven, quote, okay. Right, 65, because that meant that the character seven was the numeric value 55, okay? I'm, I don't know why they came up with such an ugly way to type in characters. You know, that's just really strange. You know, you know, the C way of doing it is so much nicer. We'll see what the single quotes are. The single quotes have a very special meaning in ML. We haven't gotten to them yet, but they, they I guess they got stuck with the single quote meaning something else so they couldn't use it for, for characters. So the character notation's really ugly, pound sign, double quote, the character you're interested in, close quote. Okay, so that added 10 to the, to the numeric value of U. So the numeric value of U would be 117, okay? Okay, okay. so defining functions is pretty simple, okay? Defining function, and, um, I made a little summary here. One last thing. Here's how you, def here's, a, here's a way you could define a function. Here's the simplest way to define a function in Java. Like if you're working in a REPL and you wanted to find a function in Java, you have to wrap it in a class. But notice that in Java, you say what the return type is, what the type of every input is. So in Java, you declare the types. Okay, so you say my function takes in an x that's an int, a y that's a double, and it's returning a double, okay? The ML compiler, you type the name, you say fun, f, x, y. Now, normally you don't put any types in, but here I'm, I'm forcing x to be a real. So that means that this should be real plus real. So this becomes real plus uh, real. So this function ends up being real plus real, whereas this was double, this was int and double, this one ends up being real and uh, real. Or I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. Th I, I'm res this result is real, so this one should be real, but that means this is an int. So this is the ML version of this guy here. X is an int, because you convert ints to real, then you add the real to the real. Since the result of this is a real, this addition has to be real plus real. So this is the ML version of this guy here. It takes in an int and a double. Now ML infers the types for you, okay? You declare types in Java, ML infers types. Then here's the equivalent in JavaScript, except in JavaScript, it's nuts. JavaScript doesn't have types for these variables. JavaScript waits till runtime to decide what to do. JavaScript uses runtime typing. So let me just show you real quickly what I mean by that. If you take that thing and you plug it into JavaScript, the fastest way to go into JavaScript is just to F12 brings up the debugger. There's the console window. There's my function, okay? F of three, five. F of four, five is nine, okay? But f of cat dog is cat dog. f of cat seven or six, notice, oh, what did I do wrong here? Oh, I forgot to close the quote. Notice that there is no real type to the function. Py JavaScript will add any two things together. So at runtime, it just says, whatever this guy is and whatever this guy is, I'll try to figure out a way to add them together. There is no sense that this is a function of integers or doubles. From the point of view of JavaScript, this is just a function that takes in two thingies. And then at runtime, it'll try to figure out what to do with the two thingies to add them. And JavaScript can add almost anything together. I don't even know if I can come up with something that JavaScript can't add. Um, 
I mean, if I make this a list, I mean, if I'm, I'm adding a list to a string, JavaScript will do it. It'll add a list to a string. Uh, it'll add, a, let's see if it'll add a Boolean to a list. Yep. Yeah, JavaScript is, JavaScript will make an attempt to add anything to anything. So at runtime, it doesn't know until you execute F what its input is going to be. So this is referred to as runtime type checking. F has got Boolean list, string list, string int, two ints. Here, I'm going to give it an int and a double. Oh, look at that. That's weird. Why was that one really weird? I gave it an int and a double, and it gave me back what looks like an int. It's not 9.0. What if I give it 5.1? Okay, now I get 9.1. <laughs> you know, if I give it 5.0, I get back 9. You know, uh, JavaScript has got very, so, so there's real differences in these languages. In Java, you declare types. In ML, everything has a type, but the ML compiler figures them out for you. So like Java, every variable has to have a specific type assigned to it, but the compiler will do it for you. That's called type inference. And JavaScript is what we call a runtime typing language. You don't say anything. There are no types to X and Y. This is not a function of integer, integer, or anything. It's just a function of two inputs. And at runtime, JavaScript will do whatever it can to try to add them together. If you actually find two things that don't add up at runtime, you'll just get an error message. If at runtime, it cannot add the X to the Y, if you can find something in JavaScript that doesn't add together, what you'll get is a runtime error message saying, I couldn't do the addition. But the, the compiler, you know, the, the language doesn't say anything about types here, okay? Very big difference. Declarative types, type inference, and runtime typing. And that's leading into chapter six, the next chapter of the textbook. So we'll quit here, but in the, in the textbook, the next reading assignment is this chapter on types. And it's a very good explanation of how programming languages handle types and these different ways of dealing with types. Not all languages treat types the same way. JavaScript has one way, Python has another way, uh, ML has another way. J J Py ML is actually closer to Java than it is to either Python or JavaScript, okay? ML would be much closer to Java's way of thinking, very far away from Python and JavaScript's way of thinking, okay? Anybody, any questions? We'll quit there. Anybody got any questions before we did? Oh, somebody, there is int to string. Was that, was that how to get the two string? Yeah, that was the two string. Is that in ML? Yeah, I tried it and it worked. So 45 dot two string? Uh, I would have been int dot two string and then in parentheses 45. Say again, what do I type? Uh, in dot two string and then in the parentheses put in 45. Dot. Oh, so it's uh, capital S? Yeah, you oh. might need a capital I for int two. Yeah, so that's, so that's saying in the int library, there's a two string function and then I give it a 45. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've heard. so see, it's these other, real quick, the difference is the ones that were in that list, those are built into the language. So you don't have to call them from a library. So these are all built into the language. This one is in a library, it's in the integer library. So you do the, you, you're using a function from the integer library. They call it a module. So we're using the two string function in the int module. Whereas these other ones were built into the language. So ORD, you know, like is real is just 
real, you don't have, it's not in a module. It's just there. Okay. So he wasn't using it. So he hasn't introduced the idea of finding a function in a library yet. So for some reason, the, the two string method is in the integer library. And that's worth remembering. I have to try to remember that. I keep forgetting where they put two string. Okay. So, so that's how you would convert a, an integer to a string. All right. So it's a library function. Okay. All right. So we'll quit there. And, uh, you know, you got a homework assignment for ML. If you have questions, come to office hours or send me an email. Uh, it'll be a little bit tricky to get started. And, and that's why some of those, the, the problems are actually pretty easy. The hard part is getting used to working with the ML system, okay? So they're, they're, they're not hard programming problems, but you gotta get used to using ML a little bit, all right? Okay, so I'll go ahead and, anyway, last, any last second question? Okay, so, I'll go ahead. We'll, we'll meet again on Tuesday. So have a nice weekend and see you on Tuesday. Bye.